Hamsters are going away, but. <laughs> Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our November 5th uh, meeting. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is a hybrid meeting, so we do have people online as well as uh, in the audience here. So uh, I'm going to start off with the land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the township of Havelock Belmont Methuen is located on the Treaty 20 Mississauga territory of the Mississauga and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations which includes Sturb Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Osele, and Georgine Island First Nation. The Township of Havelock, Belmont, Methuen respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of the lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. Um, I'm gonna remind Council of Declaration of Superior Interest if it arises. And I'm going to ask everyone to please turn your cell phones off or click them on vibrate so it doesn't disturb the meeting. Uh, with that, we'll move in. We do have some minutes here from the special council meeting on September 10th for strategic planning and the regular council meeting on October 15th. Um, I'll let the motion of everything in order to receive those. Moved by uh, Councillor Doherty, second by Deputy Mayor Webb. All in favor, and that carries. So the next item on here is we're going to move right into delegation. And our first delegation here is Mark Rundle with TD Bank. Um, welcome, Mark. And uh, yeah, this is with regards to uh, deposits and how it works. So I just want to That's OK. That's OK. So thanks for uh, thanks for having me out here. Um, so I am my name is Mark. I am with TD Bank. Uh, I'm with the uh, Eastern Ontario Commercial Banking Center out of Kingston. I've been asked to come and speak today at the meeting uh, in regards to um, we call it the bill payment receiver service. Kind of just how it works. Give you guys some high level. Happy to take any questions that anyone might have about the service. Um, yeah. So. Uh, and it, sorry, this all ties into, sorry, I should preface the tax payments that took place on uh, September the 30th. And so that's just what kind of sparked this. So um, there we go. So what is bill payment receiver service? So T Bank calls it bill payment receiver service. So basically, it just simply allows your company uh, or the township to receive payments from individuals, either through online banking channel, um, telephone banking in branch or at the ATM. And those can come from, obviously from TD Bank or any financial institution. Um, and then of course, information reporting comes in the following day, uh, just with the details contained within those payments. So payee, amount, date, et cetera. Um, so for the purposes of reconciliation. So I think the key piece here is uh, is timeline. So what does payment processing timeline look like? And so I, I do want to preface that the township, um, the township's lead bank for this particular service is TD Bank. So individuals paying from TD Bank um, are are treated a little bit differently than coming from a financial institution, simply because of the push, uh, the push of the funds from other institutions do take time. But of course, within TD, the money is already here, so it's a little bit quicker to arrive. So each financial institution offers their own timeline. Uh, however, TD Bank to TD Bank is eleven fifty nine of the same day. So uh, because each uh, each institution does offer a different time, uh, we have posted below. So um, you receive value for accepted payments made by TD Canada Trust or TD Bank customers through the Green Machine Easy Web or e Easy Line um, prior, made prior to 11.59, uh, same day credit. So now I have to preface that it is a business day. Everything with respect to the service is all surrounding business days, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that's a key, a key factor here. Um, day two is where you would receive funds from other banks. So schedule one banks and credit unions, uh, other schedule one, schedule two and credit unions it will arrive the next business day. And then of course the reporting for those particular payments follows up the next business day. Um, I'm going to try again. That work? Uh, oh, I skipped the slide. So this here is just the flow, a simple flow of funds. So bill payments are made either again online, telephone, ATM, or in the branch. Uh, payments are processed by the various financial institutions. 
Um, the funds are then pushed to TD uh, to TD Bank electronically, and then again, the reporting, whatever reporting that uh, each client would prefer, either fax or electronic, uh, that it is provided the next business day after that payment. So this one's a little bit of a flow a flow chart to show how the payments come from different uh, financial institutions. So TD Bank payments made up to eleven fifty nine Eastern Standard Time are received same business day. And that is, I preface there, TD to TD only. Uh, and then the reporting is available the following business day. Other Schedule 1 banks. So other Schedule 1 banks would entail Royal Bank, Scotia, BMO, and Royal Scotia, BMO, and CIBC. Um, so payments made before 2 p.m. on the business day will arrive the next business day. Payments made after 2 p.m. Uh, will arrive in two business days. And then, of course, the reporting, again, is available the next business day after that payment. And then Schedule 2 banks and credit unions. Again, Schedule 2 banks would be like National Bank, Canadian Western Bank, and credit unions. I think maybe probably credit unions are probably the most popular up in this area. Um, those ones, we just simply say to allow 40, 48 hours uh, for funds to arrive. Um, I can't speak as to why, but credit unions are just a little bit slower when it comes to money movement, and uh, it's not to talk ill of them. It's just the same thing with the push-pull system uh, for electronic, uh, electronic payments. I took a I took a screenshot here of um, what a client view would look like when going on to TD Bank, and I, I'm only going to speak to TD Bank. I can't speak to any of the other other financial institutions or credit unions, but I can speak to our platform. And so when you go onto the platform, you go to select pay bill. There is a little link at the bottom as to when my payment will be processed. So any individual who's paying a bill can go and click on that and see when their payment is actually going to be processed. It takes you over to our FAQ. And then it shows weekday payments uh, and weekend payments and the timelines affiliated with each of those. Um, and then it, there also is on that page a hyperlink as to what transactions are affected by holiday processing. So if you click on that, it brings you over to all the different types of payments that are affected by holiday processing. Um, obviously, I've highlighted bill payments because that's the, the particular uh, transaction in question today. So it absolutely they are affected by bank closures. Um, Slide. Uh, I took a, a screenshot of, of our holiday schedule. This is non-exhaustive. Um, I could have included all of them, but the font would have been too small and I didn't want to add additional slides. But this one just highlights September 30th. So, of course, the bank was closed um, on September the 30th. I think all banks were closed as a federal holiday. Um, I, it, it, it should, I should highlight as well, because uh, I understand that the township was open on September the 30th. And although this the township was open, because the bank was not open, it is deemed a non-business day for our purpose. So when I talk to the flow of funds and, and how things arrive the next business day, September 30th does not apply in this case. So everything would have been up, up, done on October 1st date. Um, that's really all I have. So um, I'll obviously open the floor to any questions uh, that, you, that you folks might have. If I happen not to know a direct answer, I will be happy to take it away uh, and follow up by my communications normally done with uh, Kayla and um, Lionel, uh, Lionel. So uh, any any questions that you guys might have for me? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks very much for the presentation. The first question, was this the first year for the September 30th? Was This was not the first year for September 30th holiday, no. So you, the banks were closed last year on September Yeah, 30th. so they were. Um, and I looked back, and September 30th last year fell on a weekend. So therefore, the taxes would have been due the last business day, which, I don't quote me, might have been the 28th or the 29th of September, and then the 30th fell on the weekend. So um, it, it kind of hit, hit hard this year because it was probably the first year that it fell on a, we'll call it a weekday. So obviously the situation where we got into here is that we've got people that have said they've paid on the 30th, mm -hmm. but obviously money hasn't come through to us until first, second, third, whenever it was. Correct. In the presentation, I see um, when somebody makes a payment, the funds are withdrawn immediately, it says, yeah. dated that time. But I guess if you're TD, the transaction process is the same day. If it's not, it's the next day or two so days. So keeping in mind that it's the same business day, right? Yeah. So if an individual paid um, on September the 30th, we absolutely would have debited their account immediately because they're not post-dating their payment. If you post-date the payment, the payment does not 
leave the account until that day. But in this particular case, they are asking for the payment to be processed immediately. Um, however, because the bank is closed, we basically store those funds until the next business day and we release them, which in this case would have been October the 1st. We would have released them to uh, the financial institution, um, uh, which was sorry, not the financial institution, um, yourselves, the township. Um, and uh, and then the reporting would have followed up the next business day. But TD to TD, your payments would arrive on, on October the 1st. If, you, if an individual would have paid from Royal Scotia, et cetera, the payments would have arrived October the 2nd. And then individuals with credit unions could have possibly been October the 3rd, just again, based on their processing timeline. So TD to TD, you've taken the money on September 30th, but you're not processing it until the 1st. Until the, until the next business day. So why is that? Because you've obviously taken the money out of somebody's account. Why could not be processed the same day? For sure. So it's be, it's simply because it's not a business day. We don't move money on business day. So if that was a business day, that would be processed at that moment. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it would have been the same. It would have been reflected September the thirty. So so let's take for example, if somebody would have paid made their payment on September the twenty ninth. Yeah. Uh, the funds would have left the account on September TD to TD. Mm -hmm. uh, would have left the account on September the twenty ninth. They would have arrived with credit. Um, to the township as of September the 29th. The reporting okay. would have just been pushed a day because of the holiday. If that, I hope I'm making myself clear. Yeah, I'm just trying to get through because it was my understanding, like I guess it's, in, you're saying within TD, it would be like that. My understanding was that if I make a payment, like I use RBC, but if I make a payment at two o'clock or one thirty today, yep. that money goes through to wherever it is at that moment. It's processed that day. It doesn't wait till... So, so the answer to that question would be no. Um, just based on the, how the product works, if you make the payment by one, as you said one thirty today, um, then the payment would arrive to the institution on the following business day, and that's again the push of the money of the flow of money EFT sent via EFT or electronic funds transfer. Um, those get processed overnight. Okay, so I understand. I don't know why you're why you why the hold is there, but that's probably a banking thing. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I just don't understand why you're taking the money from somebody on a certain date, but we're not processed. I, I get it in terms of whatever, but to me, for the person that makes that payment, that 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 payment should be processed on the day that the money is taken out of their account. It shouldn't be held for a day, and then in this case, you know, they get hit with a penalty because of a banking, as far as I, I can see. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would classify necessarily as a banking rule as much as the bank is closed. If If... The township is closed. Nothing really gets processed. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm if I'm correct, so the same thing would be applicable within the bank. Yes, we should take those funds because we want to make sure those funds are available and and can satisfy the payment. That's why if you do post date a payment and we don't take those funds, we make a hundred dollar payment and we go to take it out two weeks later and the funds aren't there, we actually bill you with an NSF fee. So we do take the funds immediately to ensure that the bill is satisfied. So I mean, when we process, we push funds on the next. Day. I understand that being a holiday. Say so that September 30th wasn't a holiday and somebody made that payment on September 30th. What I'm being told by some staff is that we might not get that payment till Monday or Tuesday of the following week. My question. So let's is, remove the holiday. Yeah. Yeah. So if we remove the holiday, September, if, as long as the payment is made, um, again, TD to TD, the funds would arrive same day. Mm -hmm. If you make the funds, uh, make the payment prior to 2 p.m., the funds will arrive the next business day, but be credited the day that the payment was made. You would get credit for, but the funds arrive. But because in this particular case, we're pushing, the, like you made the payment on September the 30th, we're not moving any money for you until the 1st. Okay, so, so if somebody came, paid so, their bill at, say, 4.30 on a Friday, the Friday, that Friday wasn't a holiday. Your your payment you're actually operating on Monday's date and and that particular even though the bank is still let's say it's four o'clock even though the bank's still open See, yeah to me that's something I don't know that's something maybe you guys need to look at in terms of because you're taking people's money from them and I understand it's only twelve or twenty four hour period but they're not getting credit for it and in cases like this now they're getting hit with a penalty for money that you've already taken from their account for sure and 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 I'm going to speak to the human the human side of things I, I mean I can appreciate where like. The literal sense of you're taking the money out. I've now satisfied my obligation. What the bank does with those funds after the fact, I, I can't really speak to or whatnot. And and there's a part of me that agrees with that. And then there's a part of me that there is processing times. And that's why and I, I can't I've never seen um, a township tax bill, uh, but I can speak for other bills that do say, you know, please ensure three to four business days to allow for your payment to be processed. 
to allow for those processing delays, right? There is definitely a delay in the bill payment system. That's just how it works. Same thing with, with payroll, de um, payroll deposits. They need to be processed a couple days before the pay is actually deposited to the account. It's the same concept due to the EFT system needing the overnight to uh, let's say process. Okay. Oh, I appreciate all your answers. I'm not trying to Right. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm here to answer a solution, and that's why that's why I came. I make this better for our ratepayers moving forward, right? That we don't run into this situation. So, yeah, because that's why I'm going to get from the, the people that paid it. It's like it's gone out of my account. Yeah, and I'm not getting credit for it till three or four days after, and now I've got a penalty. So, which I understand. It was just a. <laughs> I don't want to speak opinion, um, but it's just an, a series of unfortunate events with how the holiday fell. Yeah. It fell on a Friday. Uh, then, of course, you have the Saturday, Sunday. And then um, the uh, uh, the Monday is when everything's operational. So it's three days later. Well, moving forward, we've I don't we've had a general discussion, but we've kind of had small discussions about um, how we can improve this. So I mean, what's been thrown out is do we delay like do we delay it so instead of the last day of the month to the second or third to avoid the situation, or is that just going to push everything two or three days further back in terms of the, the same problem? For sure. And so I, I actually reached out to a couple. So we banked at a few municipalities through our office and I reached out to them just searching for their opinion. What do you do in, in scenarios like this? Um, and the one that stood out to me was if an individual wants to manually pay their bill, they've moved the due date to one business day ahead of time. Um, if they're collecting it via pre-authorized payment, which I understand the township does not collect at the end of the month, um, they actually push that date to afterwards. So if you're manually paying it, it'll say on your bill, due date is this. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's pre-authorized payment, it's delayed a day. So in, in the event that that particular individual doesn't know that their payment's delayed, well, it's better delayed than to be taken out of their account early. So what's just moving forward, is it better for us to just go ahead and try and educate our residents in terms of these are the rules and this is why you probably want to pay before the last or second last day of the month? Or is the way we, we can tweak this in terms of, as I said, either putting off the pay period to a day or two after the end of the month, or is that just something where, as I said, that's just going to kick the problem three days later? I wanted to stay away from opinion through this and, and speak more to fact. Mm -hmm. But if I was to speak for the public, I would say that it's much easier to delay a payment or push it two days or a day or what have you, than it is to try to educate the public to say, hey, <laughs> we're not changing our due date, but it's still due, right? It's in, in, It just potentially would cause less um, harm for everybody involved, including the township, um, to to push it a day or two after that particular holiday or change the due date completely and make it due the last Monday of the month instead of the last business day of the month, right? And then you're not flirting with, the, with any particular holidays. However, September would be the only one, but there's other there's other months of the year that do have holidays as well that could potentially impact if you do formally change the entire structure. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. I'm Jerry and then Bob. Very chair. Um uh, slide number, I guess it's uh page 26. The the changing of the terms of uh, like 830 midnight. And these things, when did when did this new policy come in, or has it been in effect since day one? of computerization? Um, I don't have an answer for that. I, I don't know when the, the form will change. I know when I first started in banking, um, when we when I was a teller, that we would close some of our wickets down at approximately 5 p.m. And at that particular moment, we were operating under the next business day. Um, so that would have been back in maybe 2008. So I'm guessing it, from a modernization perspective, we're able to get a little bit quicker with processing. But I don't, I don't have a firm date for you as to when that all really took effect. Because periodically, the bills used to come out, the bill themselves from the pay come out with three days on the bottom of it. That pretty well it got eliminated by a lot of them because they do receive them on the day. My problem is with this on the 20, I guess that would make it the 27th of September would be the Friday. Nobody can pay the bill on the 30th because the computers are taking a holiday. Um, but you take the money out of my account on the 27th. Mm -hmm. Where and who makes the money off of the money that you have until October the 1st? That's a very good question. I don't have an answer to that one. 
Well, I, I don't think we can really answer it, can we? Uh, <laughs> I, I can't answer it factually. I, I, I have an idea of the direction that you're headed with that. Um, we you can't have it both ways. I guess I'm saying you take the money out of my account and then you take whatever process the bank decides to make to get it to uh, the to the municipality. That That's great. But what happens to the money if everybody pays on the 27th and you keep it for three, four days? And we everyone already thinks about what the one payment is. Well, multiply that times thousands and thousands at 3% for a day. I, I, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And I don't think it does to the, <laughs> the people that say, come out of my account on the 27th. I don't have a problem there. No. But then speaking from a municipality standpoint is that the resident paid on the 27th, but as a municipality, I don't get that money. So it's sitting in limbo somewhere. Is that the... Yeah, but okay. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. But who, who gets the benefit of that? Uh, I know where you're alluding to that, but I, I can't concrete answer, but I'm happy to take that one away. Well, no, I'm just, yeah. just curious because somebody's got to... The money sits somewhere. The money's sitting somewhere, Absolutely. Um, is it sitting in a trust account? Is it sitting in, in I don't want to say escrow or something to that effect? Okay, um, okay well, that's, that's fine. But it, it makes quite a little difference when the bank changed their arrangement. Because originally when we sold people on uh, online banking and so on, you can pay every day, anytime. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, as long as you read all the rules here, like 1159, the day before, push a date. That's confusing for individuals. It is for me. Uh, I, I, like, I just want to pay it. I want to post well, data. I don't understand when computers start taking holidays. I guess that's really the other question. It's not necessarily the computer that's taking the holiday as much as it's the bank that's closed, right? But all it's done, all it's done, electro electronic funds transfer is electronic funds transfer. Yeah. It's, it's, still, it's not done by manual. There's still, there's still some processing involved. Um but I got into the weeds within my particular presentation about the the, the timeline and processing mm -hmm. because I feel that that was a, the topic at hand today. I mean, as somebody who used to open up bank accounts, um, you know, for TD Bank uh, years ago, I mean, that those aren't conversations that I get into, and I believe that's why it's prefaced uh, within bill statements is to ensure that um, you know we're making the payments three to four business days in advance so that the funds have time to be processed. That's the that's the big thing. And I, I completely understand where you're coming from. You absolutely can make payments anytime. Uh, you know, I you can't, but you can't date them on the 30th. No. It won't allow you. So the only other date available is first. Correct. This particular time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is an anomaly. It won't happen for another six years. <laughs> no. And well, it's hope it doesn't happen again for, right. for, for this well, particular scenario. The holiday on a Monday will happen. It, it, you, the bank. Can't change that. <laughs> it's calendar. No, absolutely. I know. Okay, it's, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Bob, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Martin. Uh, Mark, thanks very much for your presentation. I think this is uh, educational for all of us. Uh, I think we're all learning a little bit here today. Um, just a few comments uh, based on your presentation. Um, firstly, with respect to what happens to the money in the three days when it's the payments made taken from the account and then it sits in limbo somewhere. I suspect those decisions are made way above your pay grade, but I don't know that for sure. <laughs> um, I think there is a human element here uh, and, and, and Councillor Doherty, just to follow up his comments and questions uh, with respect to the computers don't take a holiday. That's probably true. However, I suspect there's a human element to processing some of this. So if the bank is closed, it's closed. For sure. No, absolutely. Um, even EFT payroll is sent via EFT. And as much as we release all of the information and the money ahead of time, um, the other bank has to receive and process it on their end. So there absolutely would be a human element in, in the processing of any type of electronic funds transfer uh, payment. Um, so for sure. And then the human element of people understanding that it does take time to process payments. Just not to get into a back and forth here, but if I understand the human element part of it, but they took your money. So, I mean, the bank's not totally closed if they took your money. Well, I again, the council I, is getting that. So maybe if they want that, then just don't take people's money if you're folks, right? I think would be a better way to do this. The reason to, to do that is in, in, 
is to sat it's to ensure that the funds are available to satisfy the payment, right? If your payment is thirty dollars and you have thirty dollars in your bank account, and you're like, "Yep, yeah, I'm good to go. I'm gonna I'm gonna make my payment," and your monthly service charge is coming up, drops you down to twenty five dollars. Well, in your mind, my payment's made, and I've got the confirmation that the payment was made, but the funds didn't leave, and now you're short on funds, and now we're gonna bill you an NSF fee and not pay your bill. So I believe the money is collected on that day to ensure that, I guess, to give the payee peace of mind to know that the payment has been. Um, and through you, Mayor Martin, just one more comment with respect. I know briefly was mentioned earlier about possibly changing due dates. Pushing a due date out still creates a due date. So I think that all of this information we're receiving today is still relevant. Doesn't matter when the due date is. Mm -hmm. It's still possibly one to three days for processing of mm -hmm. payment. So I think there is an education component uh, that is relevant here. Um, and I suggest that uh, going forward, we will have uh, some some education to do with, with the public and with ourselves and putting some messaging out there that clarifies how this all works. For sure. And that's, and that's, again, speaks to the three to four business days. But yeah, I, I the education piece is definitely important um, uh, at the end of the day, right? Is making sure people are aware and understand. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so at the end of the day, nothing's perfect. So the best we can do is, that's all we can do is try to do the best we can and, and try and make it work. So um, there's always going to be issues, but uh, um, I think there is some things we can do as a municipality to try and help the situation, but we might not. Uh, there's always going to be a problem. For no, sure. um, nothing, nothing is perfect. Um, I did speak, as I mentioned earlier, I did speak with other municipalities that we happen to bank at our office. And one of them specifically extended an outreach to say, if you guys would like to speak with them about how they do the processing and how they handle um, due dates around holidays and whatnot, that they'd be happy to speak with you folks. And so I'm happy to connect. Yeah. Uh, and Probably anything we can do to help. You know what? Knowledge is knowledge is power, right? So if you can have some knowledge, what you do with that, that's that's completely up to the municipality. But at least you'll have, be armed with maybe a little bit more um, ammunition, if you will, to make decisions in the future. And all townships, like it's not set in stone. All townships have different due dates. Uh, we used to be the last or the first Friday of the month uh, to get away from the first. Um, sometimes it was on the first, so we we seen problems then because the first of the month was the Friday, and it didn't help any uh, anybody. So um, that was another issue. So others are doing same thing, doing the best they can. Um, if we can talk to some of our neighbors, uh, see how they're dealing with it. Um, you gave us some suggestions here. Um, some of the things around TD, we deal with TD, so people pay them from TD. It might be a one-day delay. Um, if people are dealing with other banking institutions, it could be two or three days, depending on when it's processed. Um, those are things that uh, you know we'll have to work around. And uh, uh, for sure, technology, right? And, and it could just simply, uh, and just coming from from an advice piece, it could just simply be the wording, right? So instead of the first Friday. Could be the last business banking business banking day of the month, right? And then something to that effect, um, because that removes the possibility that it could ever fall on a holiday. It'll never fall on a holiday because it has to fall on a business banking day. Yeah, okay. business banking day. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So uh, go ahead, Jack. Just one question. Um, if you if our if the payment was due on Friday and I made the payment on Friday, are the funds not processed on Friday? Because I, it's a bank day, right? Uh, I pay my tax bill on the Friday, right? So you're saying it takes two days for that to happen. I I, I guess I'd have to uh, seek point of clarification on whether or not you're it's you process it on a. Business day it's or on not. business day on Friday. Friday. So and that's when taxes are due. So are you saying that now I'm going to be late for two days? Because I've never had that happen. There's the possibility that you are. So depending on where you bank, the funds could could be significantly delayed, right? So if you're banking with a credit union, you have to allow up to 48 hours, and that's not including Saturdays and Sundays, right? Because Saturdays and Sundays are non business days. So you would be having to be allowed 48 hours to be able to arrive schedule. Schedule one banks again is a business day delay based on that two p.m. cutoff. 
I mean, one municipality I spoke with, they did say, if you can provide me confirmation that the payment was made before 2 p.m., I'll give you credit for it. And he knew the 2 p.m. He knew the 2 p.m. cutoff. So that's it. So like for what Councillor you know, you know, was talking about, if you're a TD customer and we're a TD, we deal with TD, and, yeah. and you make a payment online at 1.30 in the afternoon on the Friday. It's irrelevant. It would be irrelevant because it's TD to TD. But... <laughs> Okay. Not everyone knows where their municipality yeah, yeah. banks. And no, no, that's true. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's like evidence. Off. I'm not okay. reaching privacy or anything. We <laughs> know that you bank with TD. And so um, the people that <laughs> at your lead bank have the advantage of, of making their payment up until 1159. Oh, same. I, I'm, there's so many angles. There's so many nuances. And that's where the three to four business days come in because it gives everybody that nice little buffer to know that their payments are, are being made on time. The other option is, is I love the idea of pre-authorized payment. Now I'm putting the, the only on the municipality to debit my account. And so as long as they debit my account, I'm satisfied, right? So if they wanted to debit me late, well, that's, 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 you know, the onus would be on them. All right. Thank you. So uh, right, all the way, um, last you speak business days. So the banks that are open on Saturday are not business days for them. No, they're operating on the next business day, which in theory would be the Monday. But you could, you see the problem visually from a customer's point of view. I can have a business day, the bank's closed, yeah. and we say the bank's open, but it's it's open, but it's on another date. It gets a little complicated for the, uh, for the it works well for the bank. Yeah, it does. I understand that. I, the bank's open on Saturdays and Sundays, and TD Bank does. I, I don't know if we've reopened since COVID on Sundays, but we used to be open on Sundays as well. Uh, was purely from a convenience standpoint, um, was to allow for individuals who maybe work um, throughout the week to have a bit of a banking day that they can go into the bank to do their mortgage that's, application. But that's why like, online banking was had too, for those who were, they couldn't get into the bank when it was for sure. nine to three. So the, the argument works both, both ways. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely understand what you're, where you're getting at. I believe the Saturdays and Sundays, and, and again, I don't make the decisions as to why the yeah, bank is open on Saturdays and Sundays. But it's more of a convenience thing than it is anything else. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Mark. Uh, lots of good things here that we can Absolutely. discuss in the future. And if we need your help, we can reach out. Doors always open. They know where to find me um, if, if needed. Um, if you need me. So thanks again for having me. Thanks, Mark. Hope I answered all your questions. All right. Thank thanks, Mark. Cheers. Motion to receive the delegation. Moved by uh, Councillor um, Clement, second by Deputy Mayor Webb. One favor. That's carried. Okay. All right, the next uh, item on the agenda is uh, development charges and uh, fire and tan. Welcome. Development charge. A lot of reading there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, make sure I go a little bit uh, quickly uh, on the presentation, uh, comes considering that I believe you've seen a sneak peek of this uh, about a year and a half ago. So, okay. uh, so thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, members of council, staff, and the public. Uh, I'm happy to be here today. This. Uh, to provide you a bit of an update to the development charge background study. Uh, so, you know, I'm here to provide you a presentation, uh, kind of go through what the study process is so far, the timelines. Um, and then since we started this process with the township, there has been a number of legislative changes. Uh, so these items, uh, again, it was an iterative, iterative process with the province. Uh, so we had to make a few adjustments to your background study. Basically, two to three times uh, in just in the last year and a half. Uh, so that'll be uh, displayed as part of my presentation today. And then I'll go through a brief overview and a summary of you know, what we use to calculate your development charges, the methodology, what we're collecting it for, and then go through some examples of exemptions that you may uh, consider uh, for your development charge background study and bylaw, some policies, and in other matters as well. Um, I am here today as well to provide you with some draft calculations. Uh, so again, through working with township staff, uh, we do have calculations now uh, for certain services. Now, keep in mind that we are also working uh, with your partners in Aqua uh, to try to determine whether a water or wastewater development charge is feasible. 
So if that is something that, um, you know, through our discussions and our conversations uh, warrants a DC calculation, then I'll be uh, in front of you again to provide you uh, what the outcome of that calculation is. And then I've also prepared a survey of the rates uh, so you can see what you would compare in terms of your draft calculations relative to your neighbors and as well as, you know, others within uh, this uh, Peterborough County and as well even going south to like North Cumberland County. So this is the process of the overview. Um, I actually presented uh, in front of council back on April, uh, you know, of last year. Uh, and that was our official kickoff meeting. I provide you a little bit of a snippet as to what development charges are, uh, you know, how we can, you know, work with the municipality in order to help assist with uh, funding new infrastructure. Uh, again, I'll talk about uh, a recap as to what development charges are meant to, um, you know, provide for a municipality. Uh, since that time, I mean, we've worked with uh, township staff, again, going through all of your public works information, parks and recreation information, et cetera, uh, to develop the draft uh, calculations of the policy we'll see today. Uh, we did actually put together a report um, near the end of last year. However, because of you know, circumstances, staffing changes, uh, legislative changes, you know, that was delayed. And you know, we now have new calculations. And we're here, obviously, to provide you with an update uh, to this process. Uh, it is anticipated that um, we are hoping to have a release of the background study by the end of this year. That way, the calculations are in 2024 dollars. If we do delay to 2025, then we have to now update and just work with staff to uh, change a lot of the calculations to be in 2025 dollars. So we're hopeful that uh, within the next uh, basically month and a half, uh, to finalize all of the calculations, the report, release it, and that would be presented to council uh, in early 2025. Now, having said that, just because it's a final background study doesn't mean that there couldn't be any changes. Uh, if there are some things that, um, you know, may be of interest to council or staff that require an adjustment or a revision, we can release uh, subsequent addendums to, you know, change any uh, portions of the background study. So we really are just trying to get the background study out in this calendar year, but that's not to say that there could be any further changes subsequent to that. And then hopefully, um, you know, with council's um, review, uh, if if it if it if all if everything aligns, then we were hopeful hopeful that council then would consider a bylaw by the spring of 2025. So then that way it would be just in time of uh, building season in order to start uh, collecting uh, revenues in order for you to pay for new infrastructure. Next slide, please. So with respect to development charges, uh, again, just as a recap, uh, again, I presented this about a year ago, but I mean, I know time is fleeting, uh, but you know, really the purpose of development charges is to pay for or recover for growth related capital costs associated with new residential and non-residential growth within a municipality. So this is meant to then offset any taxation increases, or any burdens to the existing uh, taxpayer ratepayer, because you're now putting a charge on new homes that would then help pay for new infrastructure, such as expanding your roads, building new facilities such as public uh, public works, garages, maybe a new um, parks and rec, you know, whether it's a facility or a playground. Uh, essentially, trying to tie new infrastructure that would service new growth in order to maintain the level of service that you currently extend to the existing um, residents and businesses. Now, these capital costs are in addition to what uh, you would normally require uh, developments to pay for um, as part of a subdivision agreement. So when you're going through the normal approvals, a uh, subdivision would typically build the local roads, maybe a local water main, some street lights, et cetera, all of which is their ticket. And then once the uh, subdivision is built out, you would then assume these assets. And then over time, you would maintain it, replace it, et cetera. So development charges are meant to be what type of assets you're trying to build that are more of a broader municipal uh, benefit rather than specific within that subdivision. And municipalities are empowered to have DCs. It's not mandatory, but through the Development Charges Act, you are allowed to impose a bylaw. Uh, but again, going through the proper process, such as um, you know, developing a background study and going through the bylaw implementation process. Next slide. So, because of the changes to the Development Charges Act, uh, we now have a list of 19 services that we can collect for. And you can see that on the list. It ranges from water, wastewater, storm, 
uh, services related to a highway, which is really your roads, bridges, public works, et cetera. And then as well as a whole wealth of other um, services that you could see on the screen. Now, keep in mind that um, for the municipality as of right now, uh, we have calculated the four that are highlighted in teal. So we have your services related to a highway, which again is your roads, bridges, culverts, et cetera, as well as your facilities, fleet and equipment for public works. So we've also included fire protection services, library services, and parks and recreation. Now, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, I'm also um, having some conversations with your partners in Aqua uh, to try to determine whether a water and wastewater development charge is appropriate uh, for the township, at which point, again, we will report back to council. Now, keep in mind that um, we also have uh, studies related. Um, we, you are also allowed to include any studies that are associated with these development charge works for recovery. So, for example, if you had to build a road uh, or even, you know, if you're looking at, you know, your road network, road infrastructure, you can then include studies such as a, a transportation master plan or even a roads needs study. So those would be eligible for recovery under a development charge by law. Similarly, you can do a parks and rec master plan, um, you know, water master plan, library business case fire master plan, et cetera. So there's a wealth of um, you know, studies that you can include, which development charters can help assist in paying for, as long as it ties to one of these 19 eligible services. Next slide. So just some recent changes to the legislation. And again, I'll just um, you know, overview this because I believe I presented this last time, but for the benefit of the um, everyone in the room, um, the Development Charge Act has been you know, in place since 1997. However, just recently, um, you know, there's been a, quite a bit of uh, bills, a number of bills that have um, updated and revised the Development Charge Act. Uh, so you can see here uh, the More Homes, More Choice Act and Bill 108 that essentially um, added a number of policies for uh, delayed payment agreements. Basically, if you are a uh, site plan or zoning bylaw application type of um, uh, at the development stage, you can have your development charges frozen for a period of time and when and it would only be triggered once you pull a building permit and since your rates are frozen it would be calculated as at the time it was frozen so if you were to go through any updates or increases to your bylaw well those type of developments you know are then eligible for that existing rate that they uh, locked in uh, bill 138 that just made some minor changes to bill 108 which um, you know uh, basically removes commercial and industrial from these extended periods of uh, payments um, so now if you have a commercial or industrial uh, building when you pull a building permit you pay dc immediately uh, bill 197 uh, that essentially uh, changed the fabric of the development charge act by introducing and listing out all of those services you saw on the previous screen so historically, the Development Charge Act was, you can charge for anything as long as it's not one of these five or six items. <laughs> Bill 197 made it the opposite, where you can only charge for these 19 items. A little bit of a difference, but because they're now prescriptive, you have to now play within the sandbox, and those are the only services you can include for recovery. Uh, Bill 213, uh, that essentially provided an exemption for municipalities that have um, post-secondary, um, so essentially universities. So let's assume you had, you know, a university uh, within the township, then any development on those lands, whether it be commercial, industrial, residential, uh, because it's on university lands, they would be exempt from DCs. Uh, Bill 109, that just added a number of uh, reporting requirements uh, for the finance team. So that's just a little bit more reporting that's required uh, to the province. <clears throat> And then the last three may be more familiar for everyone here. Uh, Bill 23, which one was one of the larger changes back in 2022, uh, that made a sweeping number of changes with respect to adding exemptions, providing discounts, really lowering the amounts of development charges that a municipality can collect for. Um, Bill 134, um, what this addressed was actually amending Bill 23 uh, by adding an income qualifier for the definitions of affordable housing. So under Bill 23, all municipalities that have development charges now have to exempt any units that are considered affordable, whether that's owned or rental units. 
And I have a slide later on to show you what would an affordable unit or affordable rental would look like within the township. Uh, so again, that Bill 134 just added that income qualifier where you have to be, the, the purchase price has to be either the lower of say 90% of the average purchase price or the 30th percent of the 60th percentile of income within the municipality. I know it's a mouthful, but I'll show you what that translates to later. And then Bill 185, um, this was actually released um, in April of this year and got royal assent back on June 6, 2024. And this essentially um, added a number of uh, changes that reverted the changes from Bill 23. Uh, where we're now allowed to add studies back into the calculations. So I think if you recall when I presented last time, we weren't even allowed to include studies for DCs. Now Bill, 20, Bill 185 says, okay, add it back in. So that's why I was mentioning you can add back those transportation master plans, et cetera. Um, they also removed a mandatory phase-in of the DCs. So before Bill 185, if you pass the development charge bylaw, your rates automatically drop to 80%. And then it can go up by 5% per year. Uh, and now it's mandatory under Bill 23. Bill 185 repealed that. So now if you pass a bylaw, you can implement the full 100%. Um, as well, it also changed um, a couple of other items, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but it changed the timing of payments provisions, uh, as well as the notices um, for some municipalities that don't have newspapers. So next slide. So just again, um, with Bill 23, I mean, I'll leave this here for uh, for council's uh, consideration, but just kind of go through this uh, briefly. As I mentioned, Bill 23 provided a number of reductions and deductions to development charges and the ability to collect them. So we now have to provide for affordable housing exemptions, whether it's owned or rental. Um, attainable housing units. This is not in effect yet. However, we are still waiting for the province to provide a bulletin and a definition for what an attainable house is, other than the fact that they say within the act that an attainable housing exemption is not an affordable one, but it must be sold to a person at arm's length. That's the only definition. So right now it's not in effect. However, we would write that into your bylaw. So that way, if it does come into effect, then we don't have to make any other further adjustments. Um, you can't charge nonprofit housing, um, affordable units within inclusionary zoning unit uh, exemption areas. Uh, there's also the additional rent, uh, residential unit exemptions. So if I have a single family home, I can add up to two apartments and not pay DCs on those two apartments, right? Uh, similarly, if you had a townhouse or an apartment, you can add one additional unit uh, without having to pay a DC. <clears throat> and then we have the rental housing discounts. So if you have a development and that development has to be a purpose-built rental, a uh, building that has a minimum of four units, all of which are for rental, so you can't have any of them that are owned, uh, then that would uh, count as a rental housing discount. So for every bedroom, you get a discount. So if it's a one bedroom, you get a 15% discount in the DC, two bedroom, 20%, three bedrooms or more, 25% discount. So again, a number of deductions. Um, doesn't affect the township, but you know, for those such as the county or you know regional municipalities that provided housing, social housing, uh, they used to be a DC eligible item that you can collect for and actually build housing. Well, the, the province has removed that, so uh, we're no longer allowed to collect for housing services. Um, and then with the capital costs amendments, I mean, I I'll, um, I talked about the restrictions on studies. As I said, Bill One Eighty Five reintroduced this in, so this restriction has been removed. Uh, but there's also the land restriction. So the province has not uh, came out and mentioned which service uh, for which land is ineligible. So at this time, until they come out and um, you know say and prescribe which services uh, would be excluded, any capital items that you would like to include within your background study that involves purchasing of land in order to build a facility or you know maybe uh, buy a right of way in order to expand your road, those are still all eligible under the Development Charters Act. So the full cost of actually building a facility and as well as the, uh, the land associated with it, uh, that's all included and allowed for. Now, the only thing that the, you cannot buy land under a development charge is just park land because you have the provisions under the Planning Act under Section 42, uh, Section 51, and 53 of the Planning Act uh, to not have to basically get dedication. So because you have another act, you can't use DCs to basically double dip. 
And as I said, the mandatory phase-in, so that's been removed, so I won't even speak to that. Um, however, with respect to administration, you are allowed as a municipality to um, include interest costs uh, to somebody's uh, timing of payments. So if you recall what I had mentioned earlier, if there was a development or a builder that applied to a site plan or zoning bylaw application, um, they would have the rates frozen for a period of time. Well, within that period of time, you can actually add interest costs to it, right? So a little bit of an opportunity cost uh, that the municipality uh, would have gained if you got the money up front, put in a reserve fund, maybe invest it with one of your you know, investment uh, portfolios, such as one investment or whatever the case may be. Uh, but because of you're not because you're now not getting those funds until when they pull a building permit, you can still impose interest uh, costs on those. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, a developmental charge bylaw can now be extended up to 10 years rather than initially five. And then there were some other administrative changes as well that you know will work with staff but aren't pertinent to the calculations. Next slide. So I mentioned earlier with Bill 134, it added the income qualifiers to the affordable rent and owned units. I'll leave the uh, description there for um, your review. And then with respect to Bill 185, which again was just released uh, this uh, summer, uh, as you can see, they removed the mandatory phase in, as I mentioned, we're now allowed to add studies back in. And that DC rate freeze, initially it was two years from when you got an approval for a site plan or zoning bylaw application to when you pull the building permit where your rates are frozen. Uh, now it's 18 months. So the province, you know, while you, they're recognizing, yes, we should have some frozen rates, uh, they would like the builders or developers to build quicker than waiting a full two years and holding up the rates. Um, as well for some municipalities, which doesn't affect you, but uh, those that did pass a bylaw under the Bill 23 regime, uh, they would have had you know, those mandatory phase-ins, no studies included within their DCs. Uh, so those municipalities have a minor amendment clause where they can just open up their DC bylaw to add back studies or maybe remove the phase-in without having to go through the full um, implementation process of undertaking a public meeting, going through an appeal, et cetera. It's just a quick and simple uh, minor amendment. And then the last one on that list, which I think is beneficial for a number of municipalities, is the modernization of the public notice requirements. So it's not just for DCs, but it's also under the Planning Act where you know, a lot of notices um, require advertisement in a newspaper. And so it's a bit of an, uh, an older regime. Uh, because not a lot of municipalities have physical newspapers anymore. So that just now says in the absence of a newspaper, in the clerk's opinion, uh, you can then put the notices on the municipal website as long as uh, you know, the clerk believes that it, it provides a widespread um, you know, reach uh, within the uh, township or any municipality. Next slide. Um, I just typically, I just want to show this uh, briefly, but just want to remind everyone the uh, relationship between uh, growth related costs and the associated infrastructure with new growth relative to where the funding would come from. Um, so it's no secret that, you know, when you have new population, new, sorry, when you have new construction of uh, uh, homes or maybe new, um, you know, non residential buildings, commercial, industrial, institutional, it comes with it new population or new employees. And with that growth um, also requires perhaps new expansions to infrastructure. So whether you have to widen the roads, provide more uh, water and wastewater, maybe some new pipes, maybe you have to provide more playgrounds because your parks and recreation says that you shall provide or you should provide, you know, one playground per, you know, thousand people, let's say. So you know, if you're going by an extra thousand, maybe you should add another playground. Um, so essentially the first, uh, the top part of this triangle essentially says if there's new users and growth, then you have to service them with new infrastructure. And really, it's no secret to it. Municipalities, they only have, um, you know, a small amount of uh, revenue sources that they can draw from. So if you don't have development charges, which currently you don't, then in order to build these new infrastructure works, uh, you're then relying on rates, property taxes, user fees, existing reserves, or debt, all of which is falling on the existing taxpayers or rate payers. So what development charges do, again, it's just an alternative revenue tool, and it's meant to offset what you would typically have to raise in taxes in order to pay for infrastructure, but then utilize the funds that you would then charge on new developments and new homes, which, again, it's up to council to decide whether that's some that's a route that they'd like to take, uh, because, uh, again, development charges are not mandatory. But you can see, um, especially in most municipalities within Ontario, 
those that do utilize it are using that money to pay for new infrastructure. Next slide. <clears throat> so again, I won't uh, go too uh, deep into the methodology. However, just want to recognize that, you know, within the Development Charge Act, there's about 80 clauses and over hundreds of sub clauses. Uh, makes for great nighttime reading if you have insomnia. But really, to narrow it down, um, there's you know six simple six steps uh, to calculate the development charges. So the first one is we work with your planners, work with the OP of the county, et cetera, as well as looking at your development applications uh, to really identify the amount type and location of growth. Where are you growing? Is it in Havelock? Is it in Belmont? Is it in Methuen? Where, where in the municipality is it actually, is the growth occurring? So that's number one. Number two then is working with staff, reading your master plans, staff reports, et cetera, to figure out, well, because of this growth, what type of servicing do we need? So we need road servicing, we need parks and rec, library, fire, you know, et cetera. Number three, while very similar to number two, then identifies the actual capital that would be required to service that. So while number two may say, I need parks and recreation services because, you know, I have a standard to keep. Well, that's fine. But then number three is, well, what would you like? Would you like a playground? Would you like a splash pad? Would you like a dog park? For us in the, under the development charge world, it doesn't matter. All three of which are recreation related. It's up to you now to decide how would you like to deliver that uh, parks and recreation. So number three is where you have that um, flexibility to decide. Uh, what type of capital uh, you'd like to include, while number two is just adhering to what your services that you'd like to provide to the community. Number four then says, okay, well, now that you've identified the cost, we have a number of deductions. The development charges, unfortunately, are no longer full cost recovery. So if you do have any grants, subsidies, or other contributions, whether it's from Ontario or the feds, or maybe even local developers providing um, you know, assistance to certain projects, those dollars need to be deducted. Uh, then we have to take a look at the benefit of existing uh, each project. We have to take a look at how does it benefit the existing community. So on a project by project basis, we then take a look at, well, how does this benefit growth versus how would it benefit the existing uh, residents and businesses? And a good example of that would say be a fire station. If you had a 5,000 square foot fire station, uh, but because of your growth, you needed to expand to build a 10,000 square foot fire station, and you were planning on knocking down that first fire station, then to us, at a simple form, again, there's other nuances, but you already had a 5,000 square foot station providing X amount of response times and fire uh, firefighters. So by going to 10,000, then technically that first 50% is an existing benefit because you already had it. You're just now adding another 5,000 square feet to service the community. So that's how we would look at it from a benefit to existing. Now, that's a simple calc. There's other nuance to it, but... Um, Happy to discuss that at a further date. And then we have also, <clears throat> excuse me, a service standard calculation. Uh, what this means is for most of your services, except for water, wastewater, and storm, um, we have to take a look at what did the township provide over the last 15 years? Because the act basically says what you want to provide in the future can be no higher than the average that you've provided over the last 15 years from a service standard. So it's a mathematical uh, calculation. It has nothing to do with your master plans on certain levels of service that you provide. It's simply listing out all of your assets over a 15-year period, how it's grown, how it's shrunk, and then dividing it by the population in each year. So that mathematical calculation provides you with a per capita amount. And then that per capita amount on average, we multiply by your forecast. And that's the dollar amount maximum that we can collect from DCs. And that'll be uh, provided within the background study. And then lastly, which is not applicable to you right now, um, if you did have any DC reserve funds um, you know, in the bank, going from one bylaw to the other, then those surpluses should then be netted off these capital projects because you already have money that you've collected. However, the opposite is also true because maybe from your previous bylaw, if you did have one, uh, maybe you had a deficit because you actually you know, had to borrow money in order to build a larger facility. So your reserve funds are actually in a deficit position. Then what we can do is put that deficit amount as part of a capital program for recovery, because then you have to pay yourself back um, with development charges because you use other sources in order to build you know, a growth related item. So <clears throat> finally, once we do all those deductions, we then have a net cost. We allocate it between residential and non-residential benefit. And then we divide by the growth forecasts.
So just in simple terms, uh, as I see the numerator is the cost of the infrastructure. And then once we divide it between the residential and non-residential growth, we get a cost per unit, whether it's on a single uh, family home, townhouse, apartment. And then on the non-residential side, typically it's a charge per square foot. So it's just uh, overall one uh, charge, unless of course you wanna slice and dice it um, in a specific way uh, based on your direction. <clears throat> Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, we do have to do these service standard calculations. I'm not gonna go through the, uh, all the steps I mentioned it, I think uh, for the most part in that uh, methodology slide. But as I said, it's a 15 year outlook. It looks at all of your inventory, dividing it by your growth uh, to get that average uh, per capita. And as I said, you don't look at it for water, wastewater, storm, and or transit actually. Next slide. Now, in terms of capital costs, um, so these are the items that would be eligible to be included within the DC. And again, we've worked with staff uh, to develop the capital listing, uh, but essentially, you know, we can acquire land or an interest in land as of now until the province says otherwise. Uh, we can improve land. So in my example of not being able to purchase parkland, that still holds true. However, if you were dedicated land or you purchased parkland using parkland dedication funds, you can actually use DCs to develop that land. So if you have raw land, you can use DCs to seed it, sod it, fence it. Again, put a park, you know, asphalt um, parking lot, you know, um, lights, washroom, whatever you want. <clears throat> Uh, you can acquire, lease, construct, improve buildings, facilities, and structures, um, which also includes the, the FF&E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, because again, a building is no good unless you actually have the stuff in it to uh, be able to utilize. Um, we can also include equipment and rolling stock, so equipment and vehicles. Now, the caveat to that, and I'll talk about in the next slide, is it has to have a useful life of seven years or longer. So that is a, a qualifier within the act. Uh, essentially, it's so that it's major infrastructure, uh, major capital, and not just you know like a, a a weed whacker or something like that, where it probably only lasts three years and it breaks. Uh, we can include lease uh, costs, so you don't have to own the building, but if you lease it, you can also include the uh, the cost of that within the DC. Uh, for libraries, they're no good without circulation materials, so we can use those uh, monies to uh, pay for that. And then, as I said, we can include studies for the above, as well as pay for the background study um, that um, you know, we're working on. And then, as well, if you do take on any debt um, because of you know, certain projects being just an order of magnitude much larger, or you just don't have the reserve funds to pay for it upfront, we can include the uh, interest costs associated with those uh, debt payments as well, as long as it's growth related. So it is uh, assisting you with uh, recovering for those amounts. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, you know, and we can use any planning horizon for the DC study. I believe as of right now, we are using a planning horizon to the mid 2030s because it aligns with the, um, you know, with the county's uh, OP projections for the township. And as I said, we have to reduce all these costs by grant subsidies, contributions. And we can also include costs that are proposed to be incurred or authorized to be incurred by the municipality. So what that means is, obviously, if it's within your capital budget, that's easy enough. We can include that within the DC. But the DC is a longer-term forecast. So it can also include items that may not have been within your budgets, but it is something potentially that would be then brought back to council for an annual approval uh, in order for you to proceed with a particular project. And then with that uh, last piece, uh, by others on behalf of the municipality or local board, you don't have to incur the cost yourself as a municipality. If you, let's say you have a cost agreement with your neighbor, say Ashford Del Norwood, and they provided you with, I don't know, um, you know, a portion of their fire uh, safety or something, or fire protection, then any expansions to their service that would then benefit you, you can include those costs within your DC and then pay them back, uh, pay them with the DC monies. And again, that works with any other service, whether you're purchasing water or purchasing uh, you know, um, you know, winter control maintenance uh, from another municipality, right? If they have to buy new plows in order to pl uh, plow the township's roads, you can use these things to assume that you're paying for their, you're essentially buying their vehicles on their behalf, but it's to service you. And I already mentioned um, the items that we can't include, parkland acquisition, uh, vehicles and equipment less than seven years, um, you know, the studies that's been, uh, again, that was included, but now removed, but now included again. And then with the computer equipment, 
Uh, essentially, what this says is if it's integral to the delivery of the service, then include it. But if it's like equipment for, let's say, the librarians just to do their administrative work, then that's not included for the DC because that's more of the uh, operations. Uh, it has to be, you know, for the public to use, like, you know, an internet access station. Next slide. Um, I'll just quick go through this briefly. I think I talked about most of this earlier, but, um, you know, there are some exemptions that you have to adhere to no matter what. Uh, all the ones in orange I've already discussed, but the top one, uh, the first two, I'll just uh, quickly go through. Uh, if you do have a development charge, uh, you cannot charge the upper tier uh, if they were to construct a building, a DC. Likewise, if you built a facility, you don't pay the upper tiers DC if they have one. Uh, and then, you know, with respect to school boards, they're higher in the pecking order. They're coming out of the province. They don't pay a municipal uh, development charge. And then for industrial buildings, uh, the act does allow for um, a provision for them to be able to expand uh, their facility without having to pay a DC up until 50% of their uh, current square foot. So this is going to be a line in the sand that we put up within your bylaw. So it's a one-time expansion because you don't want this abused where you have an industrial development, 100,000 square feet, come in, pull a building permit up to 150,000, not pay a DC, come back next year, pull a 75,000 building permit and then go to 225, so on in perpetuity and never pay. Uh, so it is a one-time exemption. And then the rest of the items I've talked about earlier. Next slide. Now, in addition to the uh, mandatory exemptions, most municipalities also provide discretionary exemptions as well. So this is a made in, you know, the townships, uh, you know, policies of what do you want to exempt, you know, at the end of the day, in addition to uh, what is already mandatory. Um, you as a council have a ability to reduce the DC in whole or in parts. So you can elect to, you know, only charge a portion of it, or maybe only charge a few services out of the all the ones that we've calculated. Or you can, again, reduce the DC maybe for a certain type or class. So maybe you want to exempt industrial or maybe exempt you know, places of worship, churches. Uh, that's all in your ability to do so. Um, you may also phase in the charge over time. You know, if you feel that the, it's a significant increase um, you know, then or something that you want to ease into, uh, you have the ability to you know, maybe do 50% this year, 100% next year, or whatever you'd like to do um, in that respect. And then there's redevelopment credits. <clears throat> so what this means is if my house burnt down, not on one hope it doesn't, uh, I should be allowed a period of time to rebuild it without having to pay a DC. Uh, likewise, if um, you know if you had a single family home, you want to tear it down and you want to build three uh, townhomes, then the redevelopment credit is whatever you had to pay for those three townhomes less what your single family home would have cost today. So in that example, let's assume a single family home has a DC of $20,000, but then a townhouse is $10,000. So how that calculation would work is I tear down my single family home, build three townhomes. So I pay the three townhomes times $10,000. So that's 30 grand. But then since I already had a single family home on there, then I take my 30 less the 20,000 that that how that, that single family home would have paid in DCs. So really my net payable is only $10,000. Because the, man, the way the DCs work is it's meant to capture the capacity and the services that you are extending off of the, uh, you know, to provide to the populace. So if a single family home already had three people, but then, you know, you're adding, uh, you know, five people because of these, uh, you know, townhomes, then really the DC should only reflect those two additional people that are coming into the town, right? Hence there's that credit. And typically, we do provide a time to this. Uh, most municipalities do five years. So you don't want someone coming to the township, you know, with a picture from 1905 saying, oh, I had a, t I had a house here. It's just been a vacant property for 120 years. You know, so it, it's, that would be a bit silly. So you'd want them to pay a DC. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that we are working with staff is to develop some potential uh, discretionary exemptions for council's consideration. Again, looking at the best practice with uh, you know other municipalities in your area. But just for uh, your benefit, um, the most common discretionary exemptions uh, that we typically see in Ontario are places of worship, um, you know the farm buildings, like the actual farm, not the house that's associated with the farm. Uh, we do see some reductions in industrial development. Uh, there may be some CIP areas such as, you know, downtowns or, you know, infill lots, 
brownfield developments, hospitals, and then colleges and, uni and uh, universities. Those were discretionary exemptions historically, but I mean, most people still write it in, but the act changed it so that it's now mandatory. Anyways. Next slide. So almost done. I just have a few slides left, but essentially um, with respect to that affordable definition, uh, if you recall, I mentioned earlier, right? It's There's now an income qualifier. Um, so essentially for Havelock, um, you know, the township, uh, if you look at the right-hand side of the table, <clears throat> you'll see that in order to be considered an affordable uh, house uh, within the township, your the basically the purchase price has to be less than three hundred and one thousand eight hundred dollars. So this is coming out of the province's bulletin. So it's not you know it's not my numbers. These are straight from the province. So if there are any single family homes, townhomes, or apartments. Unless the purchase price is less than three hundred one thousand eight hundred, they would pay a DC. So it's only if it's uh, less than this amount that it would be exempt. And then, and this is what's considered your thirty percent of the sixtieth percentile of income within the township. And then just above that is the rental uh, portion. So the, while the bottom is an owned unit, uh, if you're renting within the township. Uh, it's considered affordable if a bachelor or studio apartment is less than $877 a month, a one bedroom is $1,173, and then coincidentally, a two and three bedroom plus is the same amount at $1,280. So if um, those thresholds are met, then you have to provide an affordable uh, housing exemption and they don't pay the DC. Now, I would just want to caveat before we go to the next slide is with these affordable housing initiatives, the municipality shall enter, so it's a shell, it's not a maybe, uh, you shall enter into a 25 year agreement with these developers or these homes to ensure that they re remain affordable. Because once the bulletins are now published, which I believe would be annually, uh, these numbers will change. So if at any point in that 25 years that this, um, you know, the affordable unit is sold, or if that affordable monthly rent no longer uh, meets this affordable criteria, then that provides a municipality with the recourse to charge DCs again. Now, we're still unclear as to um, what DCs will be charged. Is it gonna be when it was first developed uh, through the agreement, you know, as of 2025 or 2024? Will it be the DCs prevailing as, as of the day? Uh, will it be the DCs with interest? Uh, and who's gonna pay? Is it gonna be the initial builder that built it? Is it gonna be the new homeowner? Um, all of those items have not been fleshed out because the province, um, they said that they may prescribe a template for these agreements, but they never released one. So right now we are working with uh, our municipal partners such as the Municipal Finance Officers Association, um, as well as a number of other municipalities, you know, City of London, City of Hamilton, et cetera, working with their legal teams to try to develop a template that could be used for most municipalities uh, within Ontario. And of course, with any new legislation, I mean, it could get challenged. So this is something where, you know, the larger guys are going through it first, and then usually the outcome of that then gets trickled to everyone else. But this is something that we will keep the municipality uh, uh, prized of. So once we do get those agreements, uh, we'll make sure we let you know. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'll just touch on this briefly, but essentially uh, what a local service policy is, is that uh, we are including an appendix within your background study that specifies what is going to be a capital item that's included within the DC. And what is your expectation of a developer to build uh, within their subdivision on their own ticket? Um, so typically, you know, what we then identify is, you know, if it's a local road, local intersection, uh, local water, wastewater, et cetera, they would build uh, themselves. Anything that's above and beyond this, which again, more you know, collector roads, arterial roads, you know, that are really uh, more of a, 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 a goods movement or outside of these outside of these subdivisions, those would be within the development charges, um, as well as maybe larger truck sewers or trunk uh, mains. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, so now just getting into the specifics of the calculations and um, I think there's only like four, four or five slides left. Um, this is the growth forecast that we have for the township. So as you can see, historically, uh, we've been averaging about just under 30 <clears throat> units per year. 
uh, which are largest uh, building permits coming in 2019, uh, which is about 52 uh, units. And, and this, for the most part, could be uh, single family homes, which are low density or medium density. Um, <clears throat> the red line represents the average, as I said, it's just under 30. And right now, what we're forecasting is for 2024 all the way out to uh, 2034. So you can see on an annual basis, um, we are estimating uh, within the growth forecast of the background stuff, uh, uh, background study, uh, roughly 25 units per year. So you can see in the first couple of years, we're at 28, cascades down to 25 uh, for a period of time, and then drops down to 23 units per year. Now, this, um, this information is based on the, uh, the work that the county had provided um, you know, under their growth forecast numbers, as well as working with um, the township staff. And just to read the, uh, the, the, the color codes, uh, the dark blue is the low density, so your single families, single family homes. Uh, the light blue is your townhomes or medium density. Uh, the gold is high density, so this would be apartments. And then the green are your seasonal. Um, which again, we should still we still need to uh, forecast because just because of the seasonal population, they're still utilizing township resources. Next slide. In terms of the uh, the summary, so again, looking at the ten year forecast, uh, you know, from twenty four to the end of thirty three, um, we're ex we're anticipating a population increase of about six hundred and twelve uh, people within the township. And that translates to about 169 new homes. Again, mixed between the single, um, uh, multiple, and then apartments. Uh, from a non-residential standpoint, uh, it's estimated that the uh, forecast is looking at 133,000 square feet of uh, non-residential building space. Now, this can comprise of commercial, industrial, and institutional. And we do have a breakdown of that in the background study. And then that 133,000 square feet roughly translates to 121 employees for the township. Next slide. So with that being said, again, I'm working with the capital program uh, that's been provided to us. Uh, we now have a draft uh, <clears throat> development charge calculation for the township of $12,387. So in this case, you know, if there's any uh, new builds, as I said, this is only for new construction. Um, if you're a single family home, uh, that's the amount with the largest component being your roads and <clears throat> so that's your services related to a highway. So again, um, and then we also have public works as well at $2,600 for your facilities, fleet, and equipment. The next largest is parks and recreation. Um, you know, we do have uh, some of those um, items identified uh, in the background study. And then we have some, um, you know, about $600 each for the fire and growth studies, and just over $230 for library. And going left to right, uh, again, the smaller the unit, the less amount of people presumably are within these homes. So you can see how the charge drops steadily on the unit size. So as a multiple, uh, the estimated charge right now is 11,168. A large apartment, 10,983. And then a uh, you know, small apartment, uh, one bedroom or studio, is at uh, just under $5,800. And then from a uh, non-residential cost for any new builds, it's $4.50 uh, per square foot. Uh, next slide. Now, so finally we get to the comparators. Um, so this provides you with uh, where your calculated charge is um, uh, as it relates to other municipalities within the area. As you can see, we did a widespread. Uh, we looked at, you know, Cavan, Coburg, Selwyn, uh, Port Hope, Alnwick Haldeman, um, we, again, yourselves, uh, Ashley and Norwood, uh, your neighbors, uh, you know, to the, really to the southwest uh, of you, uh, then Autonomy, uh, South Monaghan, uh, Greater Napanee, Hamilton Township, uh, Trent Lakes, et cetera. So you can see um, how you would read this chart. Um, the blue is the lower tier charges. Uh, the gold is the upper tier charges at the, which is basically the county. Uh, and then the uh, green would be an education development charge. And what that is, is uh, the province, uh, or sorry, the school boards, they're allowed to charge a DC as well. So uh, the green reflects the, uh, whether it's a Catholic school board or the public school board. And that you have to collect that on their behalf, regardless of whether you have DCs or not. So if you do have a building permit, you're already collecting um, you know, uh, the county's DC, and you're also collecting the DC as well. So as you can see here, your 
right in the middle, uh, basically just above um, Ashwedel Norwood. However, I would just like to caveat that Ashwedel Norwood's DC still does not include studies yet uh, because they passed when it was still under that Bill 23 phase. Uh, so if them, along with some others here um, that don't have studies within their uh, development charge block law, if they do update, then this charge will look um, a little bit different than what you're seeing uh, today. <clears throat> and next slide. Uh, in terms of the commercial, as you can see, you're more in the bottom half of this, um, of this comparator. Obviously, the largest is uh, no surprise, one of the largest municipalities within the, uh, the eastern area, uh, which is Kingston followed by Port Hope, Coburg. So really all of the high development areas within the 401 corridor. Uh, and then we get into Northumberland County. So we're looking at Hamilton Township and then, you know, Coburg. And then we get to uh, yourselves in Peterborough County. So we got Chavin, uh, you know, uh, again, Asheville, Norwood, which is uh, about uh, three rankings above you. Then we got Duro Dummer, then Autonomy, South Monaghan. Uh, I apologize for the spelling there. And then Havelock, uh, Dumont Matthew, and this is calculated as you can see on the screen. Next slide. And then lastly, with industrial, again, keeping the same um, Y axis at that $30. So you can kind of see how everyone has, um, you know, reduced their charge because of uh, certain policies. <laughs> but you can see now, you know, with Kingston, while they were the highest on the commercial, they're zero right now for um, industrial because they do exempt. Uh, however, all the other ones you see on the left-hand side, Coburg, Port Hole, Hamilton Township, Greater Napanee, Ashfordell, Norwood, Cabin, et cetera, they're all still charging uh, their industrial DCs. And you guys would, uh, you know, with the calculations as of right now for the township, uh, it would just be, again, just uh, right to the center of this um, comparator list. And next slide. <laughs> And that concludes my presentation. Uh, I know it was uh, pretty lengthy with a lot of information. Um, essentially, as I said, um, we are working right now with your water and wastewater consultants uh, to try to determine uh, the feasibility of that um, development charge related to water and wastewater. Um, but no matter what, uh, we will provide those findings as part of the background study and then have those presentations with council in early 2025. Thank you. Lots of information there. So, um, yeah, hard. You had a question. I got a few. I'll try and make this quick because I know our other delegations patiently waiting to get on. Um, quickly, um, why are we collecting? Um, I noticed it's all Peterborough County. So, why are the municipalities of Peterborough County collect the DC charge for the school board? Where I'm assuming the ones on here aren't the other ones on here. Page Sorry, yeah. 51. Um, could you just go back? Sorry, could you uh, restate that again? So, for the ones that do have an EDC, uh, what was your question, Counselor? Yeah, we're collecting the DC for the school board. You said that's the green part, right? Correct. So I'm just wondering, those are all Peterborough County. I'm wondering the ones that aren't in Peterborough County, did, they don't charge for... They're, they're, they're school boards elected not to include an the education development charge. So we're the ones that got sucked into that, basically. You, amongst other municipalities, there's quite a bit of municipalities in Ontario that have it. Saying others aren't so obviously smarter than we are. Um, um, page 49. Page 49. It's not so much. It's a little bit of Summary of growth forecast. Yes. Non residential employees. Can you explain that? The one towards them? Yes. Uh, so, this is the potential uh, number of employees, whether they're commercial employees or industrial employees, uh, that would uh, essentially uh, occupy that 133,000 square feet of uh, non residential so development. From the people moving in, that's you're estimating that's the number of jobs we're going to create in our, in our municipality or just jobs for them? Jobs for that 133,000 developments that would be within the township. So, so this is within the town. Okay. Um, quickly here. Um, in terms of the rules, um, can we run a DC for uh, like a subdivision development, but not for say uh, a build outside like a rural build? See what I I think the I know we're, we're, it's obviously another tax on on the taxpayers here, but when we're trying to collect money for future development, but. I can see it working in a subdivision where we have a developer come in and eat these feet, but just some guy out, you know, on the other side of Cordova that wants to build a house. We already have 
you know, limited number of houses and trying to get people to build more houses. Now I'm going to hit them with a ten to fifteen thousand dollar charge on top of that. You know, I, as I said, I can see if we're building a subdivision and I got to build roads and sewers and stuff. I can explain that to the taxpayer. When I charge the guy fifteen or twenty grand out near the other side of Cordova, what am I telling him that we have to do extra if he's just building it off, especially if it's off a county road? Yeah, no, excellent question. So through your worship, well, you can't treat individuals separately because that would be bonusing. It's kind of like I want to collect from Bob but not from Bill. You can establish certain ways to uh, enforce the bylaw. So, for example, if you wanted to draw a map within the bylaw that says we will only impose the DCs within this, you know, within this box, and you're basically doing it within the urban area that would basically be mostly subdivisions, then you can elect to do so. Okay. Yeah. So, that, but you can't just say I don't want this person not to pay and this person. To pay. Thank you. And just one, one last quick one, sorry. When you head up there in terms of uh, you, when you calculate RDCs, there was four or five things there. One of them was like, like who, who chose those four or five things in terms of? Oh, uh, to your worship, but this is just discussions with staff as well as looking at what services you provide. I'm just surprised because, as you said, you talked about wastewater, waste water, wastewater management. Those weren't on there, but we had like library and a few other things that, to me, wastewater and things should be on there before. Yeah, so uh, through your worship, as I said, that's what we're talking with Aqua right now to try to determine that because at the time when we first did the initial analysis back in 2023, uh, you were still going through the motions of undertaking your water and wastewater. But now that it's uh, evolved to a point where we can have those discussions, we can now like. Uh, so that was staff that made that decision? Uh, it's a collaborative approach so based on uh, looking at your current services that you provide versus we're not going to include a service that you really don't have any expansionary works for. So if you don't have any uh, new uh, infrastructure identified, then there's no point including um, that service and mm. charge associated with it because there's no uh, potential capital. But at the time, I'm not sure. At the time, we, we were we hadn't started the expansion over here and discussed the expansion because we've been talking about that for four or five years. So okay. I don't know how that didn't get included in it. It's being included. It, okay. I've had a conversation about it. It just wasn't included in the initial. No, I, I understand. I'm just saying, as I said, there was other things on there that I thought would be less prioritized than what was there. But anyways, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from council? All right. Lots to absorb there. So, but thank you very much for your presentation and uh, I'll be moving forward on. Perfect. Thank you. Hope to see you guys uh, in the next couple. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, motion to receive the delegation with by uh, Deputy Mayor Webb, second by Sean Doherty. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay, our next uh, delegation is uh, Jeff Collette or Dan. Dan? Hello. Sorry, Danny. Okay, so we all know what I'm here for. Yeah. <laughs> um, this piece of property is something I thought I'd owned for 46 years from the day I bought the cottage, right? And um, it's all popped up because of the tower, and and uh, Travis thought it was, you know, it was all road allowance and all that. And that when we come, when we approached, we went looking for this letter, we couldn't find it. We knew we had seen it. We knew we were told about it. A uh, neighbor pulled it out of her, but along with her mortgage papers, which was, I think it fell from heaven, right? Because I wasn't <clears throat> prepared to have to purchase this property, right? After me thinking I owned it for 45 years. I can remember Pat Patterson standing up at a, a, a minor variance, and he, he said, he got out in front of council, and he said, we cut this gentleman's property right in half. He ain't got nowhere else to go. <laughs> you know, as far as my credit is concerned, so uh, that, that's my, my my case, and it's like, this is up to you guys, right? I think it pretty well says it right there in the letter from 1973 that it was granted to to, to all the cottages that lost it, right? Yeah. So yeah. So the letter does explain a lot. Um, it's a different way of doing things the way we do it nowadays, but uh, um, it's all there that the property was uh, there for you to use. Um, so I think for now, it, uh, as it moves forward, um, 
it'll probably be, you know, we'll have some discussions with staff as far as, uh, but this letter is in our, on our agenda today and recognize that, that you have use of the property. And I imagine that's how, when you talk about your minor variance, um, when it comes to percentage of lot, you probably had to use that property to get the percentage to build your, your garage at that time. So that's what you're talking about there probably. So um, I've seen that in other areas where to get the square footage, you have to uh, use whatever you have. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, the road went through the middle of there. Um, and if anybody knows the area, they'll understand why the township went around that hill instead of over it. Um, but that being said, for now, we do have this letter on file. And uh, um, I think we just need to clarify in the future here, like we need to look at this and see what it really means. Like, you know, as far as you have use of it, um, you know, what does it mean around building on it and things like that. So, um, but I think that's uh, something that'll have to come forward in the future. But for now, this letter, like you say, um, explains a lot of things that uh, you're probably having trouble explaining uh, before. Yeah. Uh, you knew it was there, but you couldn't find it. So um, I'll open up to council. Um, if there's any questions for you. Or... Just, just for clarification in terms of coming to an agreement here, are you looking to, for just continued use like you've had? Or are you looking yeah, to but that'd be, I'm, I'm happy with that. Just continue with what yeah. we had. And then you yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I don't see why we should have to worry about going and getting a survey, right? In order to do it, the lawyers involved. I mean, I wasn't sure if you're in this 46 years, and let's leave it the way it is, right? You know, I just wasn't sure if you're interested in purchasing it or something like that. No, no, just keep using it the way. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, do I need a motion? To yeah, motion to receive the motion and direct yeah, staff. To direct staff. Okay. 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 Okay, moved by Deputy Mayor. Okay. Second, second by that was that was short. Sorry for keeping here so long. Yeah. Yeah. I got another. I got another eleven thirty appointment. So <laughs> I'm still gonna make. Okay. Nice. Have a good day later. Okay, we have a mover and a seconder. All in favor? That's carried. Okay. Um, so before we move on, I take a ten minute recess and then uh, come back at uh, quarter after quarter after eleven. So moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Webb. Second by Councilor Doherty. All in favor? So come on back a quarter after. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll look for a motion that we resume the meeting. Good by Councillor Clements, second by Councillor Flagler. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay, we're moving into staff report for information. Um, there's five reports here. Is there anything you wanted to speak to? Yeah, uh, just, uh, I guess it would be report number one, Mayor Martin. Okay. Um, this is with a note at the end from Josh's report about the yes, grass at the Patterson Parkette. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering if anybody else have any comments. I've had a few comments that the the sight line is not good coming, I guess, uh, west to east down George. So when you hit the stop sign, it's hard to see traffic coming up from the highway. So I don't know how that can be real. Hopefully if they can just be trimmed to a, a proper level and not taken out because they are kind of nice, but just wondering whatever the rest of the council thinks of that, if they'd had any comments as well. So normally at this time of year, you cut the grasses down. So for a short-term fix, they can cut the grasses down and then maybe we look at you know, the placement of them. That's something I think that they need to look at as far as, uh, if they're going to come back next year. Um, right now you cut them to the ground. All right. Okay. Uh, through you, Mayor Martin. Um, yes, I'm a, in agreement with Bart. Uh, it is beautiful. Uh, the grass along the um, the building yep. is okay. And I think some privacy in there is very important as well, because who wants to sit there while people are going up and down the street, right? Uh, but there is one grass, well, you can't see the belt. Yeah. So that grass would have to be trimmed or taken. No. Yeah, so if Josh is on there. Josh, have you had any complaints about the uh, grass? Uh, good morning, Mayor Martin and all council. Um, not necessarily complaints, but comments, yes, on how full it does look and how um, some comments were how nice they are. Some comments were how it's overcrowding the parkette. Yeah. Okay, so so right now for sight lines, it might be good to at least cut down the ones that are affecting sight lines, and then you can get a plan together on how you deal with the rest of them. 
Yeah, so um, staff right shortly will be going out and trimming down all of our gardens for the season. Um, and then, so next next season, we can keep them trimmed down. Um, the only thing with that is they won't have their nice flowered top, or we could look at removing some or however council directs. Yeah. Okay, well, you can get a plan, but I think for now, there does need to be some trimming and and sounds like you're going to be doing that. Uh, most people are doing it right now. So um, yeah. you'll get a plan in place for next year. And uh, um, yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay, so motion to... Yeah, and then just a couple other comments. Yeah. Um, I see we had 52 hours um, of ice rental in the month of September, which is yep. 50, 52 more than we've had the last number of years. So that's good. And um, something that's not on here... Josh, um, Josh and his crew have uh, installed a new gate at the Matheson property. I don't know if everybody's up there for the pumpkin festival the other night, so that should hinder some of the ATVs and whatnot we've got through, going through there. And um, something that's not on here, I guess he just texted me yesterday, we have the new Matheson banners that have been put up. Uh, on yeah, high that, post. So, Josh, go ahead. Uh, that is right. Um, those Matheson banners look pretty sharp. Uh, we do have one down for the uh, the entrance on George Street. We're holding off on installation until the construction's kind of wrapped up down there. Good. Thank you for that, Josh. And Josh, have you been in contact with um, Pete or somebody from Rhodes in terms of the signage for George Street and then maybe coming off the highway? We had any um, right. I have not been in contact with Peter about that, but we will be. Thank you, Josh. All right, thank you. So Ryan's here right now. As oh, far as that, is the signage urgent? Is well, that... put, I imagine him and Pete. I've okay. talked about it with Pete, so it's. I imagine it's. Okay. It works. So that will just leave. I'm good with that. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, motion for the vote. Okay. Motion for the vote. Moved by Deputy Mayor Webb. Second, Councillor Kreiger. All in favor. And that's carried. Okay then. Um, thank you. Oh, thanks, Josh. Um, so we have the public works uh, department update, the one investment update, Ontario East uh, Municipal Conference uh, uh, update of uh, Sherry's uh, going to it and, and what she got out of it. So uh, thank you for that, Sherry. And then the uh, business count report. So is there anything uh, you want to speak to? Go ahead. Are you, Mr. Mayor? Um, the public works so uh, the meter reading, is that done by staff? Correct, yeah. And how long does that take? And how often does it done monthly? Yeah, I do it the first of every month. And how long does it take? Like probably an hour, depending on which, depending if you can get into everybody, everybody's story. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. All right then, so oh, are we okay. looking on all the reports? Then? Yeah, yeah, well the investment report, I, um, is trying to get to the right page, 74. Um, it shows we have a million two hundred thousand dollars kicking around. Um, I don't know whether other councils receive information or questions on that because this will leave um, our taxpayers feeling that we have a lot of money we're not doing anything with. And uh, perhaps uh, if, if Lionel's uh, got the information, is to tell them that that is money that we've either spent or going to spend in the future, and it's not just surplus funds. So I don't know whether you have anything to add to that one. Uh, three share, uh, I do. Um, the, the money that would be in the reserves and reserve funds right now would be for, I'd say three broad categories for capital projects that have already been approved in prior years. And we set money aside in the reserves for these projects. Some because it's tied to funding. It is also for projects that we are planning to put forward in our 2025 budget. And it's also for projects that we have applied for funding for, such as the uh, the uh, Ball Diamond and the uh, Housing Enabled Water System Sun Fund for George Street. So just as a matter of providing a, a tiny little bit of information, just to get the scale of what uh, we're looking at in terms of the total of these projects. For the ones that have been approved in prior years, um, for example, community center upgrade, we have uh, $1.4 million that will be coming out of reserves for that. 
that's just one uh, project. For roads, for uh, projects that have not been completed, we have $1.3 million. And wastewater cell expansion, 620. So that's, that's just projects that have were approved in prior years. So if we go to projects that we have planned for 2025, we're looking at uh, another $3 million. The vast majority of that would be in uh, roads. We have $2 million would be coming out of reserves for roads projects, and then another million dollars for, for various other projects in the budget. But then the truly scary uh, part of the numbers is what's been identified in our asset management plan that needs to come up for renewal in the next, say, five to eight years, plus any projects we've applied for grants for. So I'll just go down some of the major ones here, but then the numbers are quite large. So for instance, the, the uh, recreation grant for the uh, park, that would be at 50% funding by the province, uh, $3.5 million commitment uh, from HBM. We have, uh, what is the other one here? Um, for the Housing Enabled Water Systems Fund that we just applied for, that would uh, include, I believe, escaping around, here it is right here. Um, we would have to kick in 27% of that cost. That would be $3 million. Our asset management program has identified $29.9 million in forecast road expenses up to around 2032. And uh, fire, we have $1.2 million in forecasted purchases up to 2032. And, you know, I could go on with smaller ones here. Oh, well, actually, these aren't just smaller ones. We have $5.5 million forecast for sanitary sewer network capital expenses in the same period, uh, 7.5 for facilities. So I think that gives everybody, I didn't add them up when I was talking, but I think the municipality's done a good job at putting money aside, but by the same token, it's not anywhere close to enough money to pay for what we have either approved already and set money aside for, or what's coming in the near future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, is there any other questions with regards to the staff reports for information? Okay, so I'll look for a motion to receive all the staff reports uh, for information motion. So I the by Councilor Clement, seconded by Councilor Dolly. All in favor, and that's carried. So next is the uh, staff reports uh, action item. So, Sherry uh, um, is on uh, for the for the cell tower. Uh, Thank you. I'm there, I'm council members. Mm. So through your mayor, um, this report presents to council information concerning the proposed wireless telecommunications tower 3C3917 to be located on the 445 West Posh Road Municipal Transfer Station property. In addition, it is to confirm the proposed tower complies with the Township's Communication Tower Installation Policy 2024-03-19 and to issue a letter of concurrence to Eric Bell Chamber, Site Acquisition Specialist acting on behalf of Rogers Communications. A little background first, as part of the Eastern Ontario Regional Network, EORN, Cell Gap Project, Mr. Bell Chamber, acting on behalf of Rogers, has applied to construct a new 90-meter guide telecommunications tower to be located on the West Kosh Municipal Waste Transfer Station, property having coordinates, see there uh, on page one. The following criteria helped with the basis of the proposed 90-meter guide tower, the proposed site location is 88 meters from West Kosh Road on a tree property with significant setbacks from water properties. The proposed site location is nearly 800 meters from the closest adjacent residential dwellings to the south. The design selected for this proposal is appropriate considering the area context and will best achieve 
Their objective as well as provide for future co-location opportunities of other wireless service providers in an attempt to reduce the number of structures in the area. Access to the property for construction and maintenance purposes will be via new access to the property and will not cause any disturbance to our property's current use, transfer activities. The installation will have no impact on the watershed or wells, water quality, or any water systems, no chemicals, pesticides, or herbicides that could potentially have an adverse effect on the water systems will be contained on our structure or the associated walk and radio equipment cabinet. During the construction, precautions will be taken to minimize any disruption to the current use of the site and to the surrounding residents. When site is in service, there will be no noise associated with the daily operation of the installation. The site will occupy a compound area, approximately 9.5 meters and 7.6 meters, surrounded by 2.4 meter high chain link security fence. The compound will also contain a walk-in equipment cabinet containing radio equipment, backup battery power, manuals, and first aid. The township is the applicable land use authority for this application, whereas the federal government is the approval authority. The Township of Havelock, Belmont, Methuen official plan designates the location of this proposed facility, a waste disposal and industrial site in accordance with Schedule A2, the Township of Havelock, Belmont, Methuen's Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, 1995-42, as amended, the subject product a property, excuse me, is currently zoned disposal industrial or M3. Most importantly, public notice of intent to construct the tower was circulated by the agent in the community press publication September 19th, with the public consultation pe period ending on October 12th. All properties located within the circumference of radius 180 meters, which should be actually corrected to three, 339 meters, were notified by September 1st, 2024, no comments were received from property owners within that radius notification area. Given the foregoing, the staff are of the opinion that proposed heavily communications tower C3917 complies with all land use requirements and Rogers has completed appropriate public consultation and therefore recommends the letter of concurrence be issued. Just to summarize, the recommendations are the council concurs, the required public consultation pertaining to the proposed Rogers communications tower site C3917 have been completed and that all reasonable and relevant concerns about the proposal have been addressed. And the proposed tower site C3917 complies with land use requirements and Rogers has fulfilled the Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada for ICID default protocol CPC-2-0-03 as they relate to the proposed site and this is to authorize the CAO and clerk to sign the letter of concurrence to permit Rogers to move forward with the installation of the proposed wireless communications tower. Thank you. Okay, then. Um, so the recommendation is here. Is what's the council thought? Anybody want to move it? Okay. By Deputy Mayor Webb. Seconded by Councillor Clement. Questions? Comments? All in favor? Then that's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. All right. The uh, next item here is Josh with regards to um, Havelock, first Havelock scouting uh, weekly meeting. Um, request here for any time to solve the motion to approve. Moved by um, Deputy Mayor Webb to approve. Second, Councillor Clement. Um, questions, comments? All in favor? And that's carried. And the next item here is the strategic plan. Um, uh, through you, Mayor Martin, this uh, report presents the strategic plan for final adoption by council uh, following the public meetings uh, and a public survey and a workshop with council, uh, two workshops actually. This is now the final document. Thanks. Okay, so the recommendation is before you. Um, to adopt, moved by Councillor Clement. Second, yep. oh, just a comment. Yep. Yeah, well, a comment. Yeah, just quickly, I'd just like to thank um, Council staff, Bob, uh, all the managers, everybody that was involved with this. Um, but the process went very well. I'd like to thank pra Val from Praxis, and I can't remember the other lady's name, but yeah. Jill, I believe, and yep. Dr. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I thought it went very well, um, and hopefully this has pro provided us with a a good plan for moving uh, the township forward here. Um, 
the one thing I would ask is um, the CAO is, um, would this be posted to the website? Absolutely. Yes, it will. So just anybody, any of the public that's wondering about the process or whatever, it'll all be there for them to look at in terms of what, what our plans are for the next few years. So thank you very much to everyone. All right, so move on to seconder. Any other questions or comments around the plan? All in favor. That's carried. Uh, question two. Uh, did we did I miss one? But it says there the annual business count report. That just that was part of the for information. Yeah, info. Yeah, one at the bottom info. Okay, but the economic development was before it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, so you got rejected, Sherry, after if you want some questions around that. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so the next item on here is uh, Bob with the uh, historical society and library. Of Can't see you, Mayor Martin. So we have received uh, correspondence, and there was a delegation from the historical society as well. And there have been conversations uh, with members of the library board and the historical society regarding the arrangement for the sharing of space uh, in the library building on Quebec Street. And this report suggests and recommends that uh, any arrangement be done in a formal written agreement in order that there are no misunderstandings with respect to the sharing of space at that location. So the agreement would be similar to others that we created and folks would have a say in so, uh, moving forward, there was a part in here about the, uh, the background of requesting six months. They were looking, Bob and I met with uh, the group uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things they said about cataloging some of the stuff, they were looking for uh, something, some help with the library about using the space for, they said six weeks um, at that thing. Like, I know this says six months, but. Um, I don't know if that has to be dealt with today or if we just worry about the agreement first and get it moving and then uh, look for the new year. If they need some space for that, we can see if anything can be worked out between the two groups. Go ahead. So through you, Mayor Martin, if, uh, if Council approves the uh, suggestion to have a written agreement, we'll staff will start the process today and we'll bring uh, a draft agreement back to Council and right. that all the groups will hopefully at the end agree to Okay, sounds good. Okay, so the recommendation today would be to authorize staff to uh, work on a written agreement between the two groups. Yeah. Okay, moved by Councillor Slagler, seconded by uh, Councillor Doherty. All in favor? That carries. Okay. Um, so the next uh, on the agenda is correspondence. We have one action item, and that would. Uh, Letter from Mr. Coffey with regards to uh, um, X pass and start today. Um, so for today, I'm going to suggest that we receive it. We're talking for the Okay. Most of the Okay. So that's moved by uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Webb that we receive the correspondence and then second by Councillor Clement. Questions, comments? Okay. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay. All right, so correspondence for information. Uh, there's a couple of items in there for information. Are there any questions around that? Comments? So, seeing none, uh, motion to receive the balance of the correspondence. Okay, and that's uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Webb and seconded by Councillor Flagler. All in favor? Terry. Okay, committee liaison reports. Two there. Um, first of all, we can go with the county council update. Oh, county. Um, really, um, I guess the meeting tomorrow. The uh, draft budget will come out tomorrow. So that was in discussion at our last meeting as well. Have more information. It looks like we're looking somewhere around the six percent from the county. Nothing's been finalized. That's just the draft, the original draft. That's where it's coming on six. So just to give everybody a heads up, and uh, if you want, I'll have more information tomorrow. And I believe the draft budget is already up on the county website. So 
anybody wants to take a look at it, you can have a look at the numbers there. I have a paper copy too. Thank you. All right then. Um, so other reports here, there was a the library board meeting on October 17th, and then there was a municipal brief from the Crow Valley Conservation Authority. Questions? But um, through Mr. Martin, to Kathy, uh, uh, in the library board meeting, it says we're doing something with North Court and Cosh Lake Library. No, what happened was we used to pay five hundred dollars a year. Remember we went to that joint meeting, Wait, and they just wanted to verify that we no longer paid that for us. We did course. verify it at the meeting. But did we not? Yeah, we did. Okay, they just wanted us to verify it for the budget purpose because they weren't at the meeting with us at the joint meeting with North Court. So they just want verification. So okay, have to thank you. Thank you. All right then. So motion to receive the two reports. Moved by Deputy Mayor Webb. Second by Councilor Clement. Any questions or comments? All in favor? And that's carried. Um, we don't have any written or oral notice of motion. Um, <laughs> Other business. Other business. So, um, in other business, uh, Councilor Schleicher had a report in there with a request for uh, gravel for mid seventh uh, unopened road allowance. So, did you want to speak to that at all? Um, sure. Through you, Mayor Martin. Uh, the Snowmobile Club has contacted me regarding the road allowance on North. Mid seven, apparently, it's been all dug up, it's not there, and they have concerns with getting a groomer through for this winter. So, they were just wondering if they could get some help fixing that section so that they can get through. Um, I don't know, Ryan, if you have anything to add. No, no, well, Pete, Pete told me about it before he went on holidays, and we do have some recycled asphalt we could take in there. Um, like they were asking for four or five trucks, four or five dump trucks, and then all we had to do was dump it, and they were gonna they were gonna move it. But I guess it would mostly depend on how far we got to go in there with those trucks. Like if we're just dumping at a certain spot and they're taking it through, or what's going on? So. So as a recommendation, if, if we were going to authorize it, uh, we would have to rely on your discretion if you can get in there or not. Yeah, right. Um, like You can't get in there. Like you can probably get in so far, right? But depending on, I haven't been through there, I'd have to see how rough the road is, right? So. Okay. I just make a motion that we direct uh, Ryan or Pete to contact uh, the Snowmobile Club and try and work this out. So to Ryan's point, if we can only go for so far, so I think we right. should talk to them to see if they can move at the extra distance. If not, there's no use going down this road, right? So and I'm sure that yeah. they would probably uh, do that. I can't speak for them, but I'm sure they'd be willing to help. And then just that. just one question. I'm not a roads guy, but when you said recycled asphalt, and we're talking back in there, is that so? We've got some. That, that's uh, it's free material. Okay. So it would come off of County Road 42. They just needed somewhere to put it. And we have it stored at Midtown. Awesome. But just in terms of, if you know these rules more than I, that's okay to put wherever that we want to put it. That's like, yes. So I can have yeah. an environment. No, okay. no, 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 okay. no. They told okay. me that was good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> that's a good question for you. Um, are we being asked by the Snowmobile Club to do it because it's on un un open road allowance? Or is it yes. something that? Uh, no, yeah, it's on road. It's on the unroad road, road allowance. But I believe that they would have taken care of it. Yeah, they have to ask us. Yeah, it's our they can't I kind of get when it's on open road allowance, but yeah. what happens if it comes to another trail and they want some gravel? I guess that's oh. my question: Is a precedent setting? And if we are, I'm just trying to clarify. That's all. Yeah. I just don't I think it's just because it's our property. It's yeah. why they're coming here. The other properties. From what I've seen in the past, they've taken care of it themselves. So, okay. All right. So, we have a mover and a seconder. A mover. Yes. Do we have a second? Oh, what's the second? To authorize staff to. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. It's a second by Councilor Flagler. Right. 
Okay, any other questions, comments? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Um, all right then, so, and that's Sherry's report here uh, in regards to the gas gift card. Yes. For draw? Yes. I know how much you like these draws. This, this particular draw is related to our launching the Instagram account, our social media account uh, back in July, uh, as well as relaunching our Facebook and um, developing a stronger communication strategy. We offered up a $100 gas card incentive with lots of responses you'll see. Uh, as of today, we have more than 400 Facebook followers. The first 500 are always the hardest. Um, so we've worked really hard at following up with all those individuals that have liked our responses or commented to invite them to follow us. I need a member of the council to draw the the winner's name. <laughs> Councillor Thorny was anxious to hop up. One second here, let me make sure we're uh, above board. Yeah, stir it up. I, I studied Braille. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Terrific. It was a one of our first Facebook followers, Monica Tucker. So we will contact Monica and let her know that she has won a $100 guest. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right, then. Um, so that concludes the other business. Um, next, we don't have any bylaws, so I'm going to have to look for a motion that we go into the vote. That can be a section. I have a Closed session under Section 239.2b for personal matters about identifiable individuals, including municipal or board employees. So moved by Deputy Mayor Webb. Second. Dr. Flagler, all in favor. Thanks, Gordon. And he can down when you get back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's got a different time. All right, so <laughs> we're back in open. Um, so we have one motion to come out of the closed session. Yes, through you. Coming through you, Mayor Martin. Uh, business arising from closed session, there is one motion. Um, and we need a mover and a seconder, and then I'll read the motion. Okay, um, so moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Webb, second by Councillor Clement. All in favor? Carried. Okay, and the motion will read, due to the federal banking holiday that occurred on September 30th, a credit to those ratepayers who paid their property tax bill electronically by September 30th and were charged a late fee will be issued a credit on the affected property tax bills. Okay, All right, so can you remember that? I moved it, didn't we? I know. Moved by Deputy Mayor Webb, second by Councillor Clement. All in okay. favor. All in favor. All right, then. Okay. All right. So, next item is the confirming bylaw. We have no uh, bylaws. So, confirming bylaw. Wait a little tiny guy. Confirming bylaw moved by Councillor Clement, seconded by Councillor Doherty. All in favor. That's carried. Motion to adjourn. Deputy Mayor Webb, Councillor Doherty. In favor, carried. Okay. Thank you.